Well, good evening and welcome to this ev the, this year's uh, Kyoto Laureates event. I'm Nairi Woods, I'm Dean of the Blavatnik School at Oxford University. It's a very special pleasure here to have our distinguished guests, to have our partners and friends from the Inamori Foundation in Japan, Your Excellency, the Ambassador of, of Japan, and colleagues from across the university, thank you for joining us for this evening's celebration of these three extraordinary Kyoto laureates. Um, it's, it's great fun to have them here in Oxford, and particularly in this place, the Western Library. As most of you know, the Bodleian Library is a very special place with over a million books, manuscripts, special um, manuscripts that many of you will have consulted in your research. And so welcome to this heart of learning in the university as well. Now, you've read about the laureates. They're an extraordinary group. And I'd like to, uh, I'd like to jump straight in to engaging them in some questions which actually lie outside of their work. And Zakir, I'm going to start with you. Uh-oh. <laughs> Zakir, as you all know, is a is a tabla player, or I think in New York, he's called a master of percussion. I suspect if you were British, you'd be called a national treasure, which you probably wouldn't want to be called, but you are an international treasure. It sounds like a statue or something, <laughs> you know. And he's not just somebody who's performed with classical um, masters in India. He's somebody that early on um, collaborated with George Harrison of Beatles fame, with Earth, Wind and Fire, with the drummer of The Grateful Dead. Quite a musical range. And it's, a, and it's lovely to have his wife here as well, a very celebrated dancer. And he's also performed with her, I'm told. Um, Zakir, my question for you is, yeah. I read a comment that you made that... Um, you would never play at a gathering or a wedding or at some event where people were socializing mm -hmm. because if it's music, mm -hmm. the audience should just engage with the music. Yep. And I wondered, in today's world, there are probably places you perform where people pull out their mobile phones and quietly buy a pair of shoes on Amazon while they're listening to you. Mm -hmm. Do you stop them? And is it... Is your idea that it's for their good because they should fully enjoy the music or is it a respect for the musician that you're trying to enforce? Well, half the time I don't know if they are actually doing anything with the phone until I receive a text from them. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, I, I believe that art as a whole, you know, music included, sculpture, painting, whatever, uh, is a very uh, positive energy on this planet, one of the few left. Mm -hmm. And uh, what it has the capacity to do, if allowed to blossom in the right environment, is to heal, is to uh, r help people recoup strength, help people focus, center themselves. And for those moments that they are in the presence of an artist who's either performing or, or in a music, uh, 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 or in a gallery, photo gallery or whatever, it's, it, if you are totally focused on it, you, it just allows you to, for those moments, forget the cares that exists outside that environment. It allows you to, to be able to, in some ways, re-energize your brain cells, re-energize yourself, and, in, and, and get the strength to be able to, and, re and be refreshed, to go out there and then face whatever there is to take care of in the world. So uh, to treat it as uh, elevator music or... Uh, or dinner entertainment, theater, theater, where it's not allowed to be able to, uh, uh, how should I say, um, 
uh, initiate its full uh, potential mm. uh, it, it is in some ways an insult or a waste mm. of, of that special, unique energy. Mm. And so that's why I have, no, I have shied away from uh, being in such places where uh, multitasking is, is, is the order of the day. And, uh, and the meditative focus on, on being able to uh, uh, re-energize yourself is not uh, of prime importance for some reason. Thank you, absolutely. Um, Carver Mead, um, our second laureate that I'm introducing this evening, you know, the godfather of some of the technology today that's, that's, that's fueling um, extraordinary advances in artificial intelligence. And some scientists um, of your generation of brilliant technologists are saying, let's be careful. And I, I just wonder what your thought is on that. Is there a little part of you that wants to just put back into a box the discoveries that you made that created a path? Or do you think that there is a way that we can now be more cautious in the way we develop them? Or perhaps, or perhaps neither, perhaps you think we don't need to, we just, we just keep at it. Well, that's a great question, Mary. Uh, I, um, I get asked that a lot. I view all of technology as a tool, and we've had many breakthroughs down through the history of technology. And every one, every single great breakthrough we've had has been treated with great suspicion about how it's going to destroy society and how it's going to reduce human beings to little slaves and all of that. And uh, the history is just full of those stories. And it's true that any technology uh, can be used for good or ill, and will be. But historically, the good has always outrun the evil. I would say, though, that part of that restraint has been the scientists themselves being restrained. Do you think there is that restraint? Or do we think we're seeing a young breed of technologists who will do anything to outdo each other and that, that that's where the danger lies? I can't, of course, predict what evil purposes are going to surface with any technology. Uh, there certainly will be. But likewise, we can't predict what great things will come of it. Mm -hmm. And just looking at history, the great things have always won out. And when you look at the work that you did, what's the development in that area that most delights you, that gives you most joy to see come to fruition? For me, the, the information technology has been the great equalizer uh, across the world. It's given human beings everywhere a connection with human beings everywhere else. And to me, that's a necessary step towards a more enlightened world, a more connected world. And I think the technology as it's being used today is opening doors for that kind of connection. Thank you, Carver. Um, Brian Grenfell, the third of our um, <coughs> Kyoto laureates, <coughs> population biologist, coiner of the term philodynamics, is it philo? Philo. Philodynamics, yes. to describe, as I understand it, the way viral evolution and epidemiology collide. So my question to you is, when is the next pandemic? <laughs> 
Well, we're not quite through this one yet, possibly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, we don't know. An extraordinary thing about um, COVID-19 was all the surprises it gave us, gave everyone, I think, mm -hmm. it, not least the epidemiologists and immunologists and virologists. So we don't know um, a, a, an unpleasant variant w with unpleasant properties isn't going to pop up. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, there are two answers, n neither that pleasant. There will be, uh, as there's more contact between humans and wild animals of various sorts, there will be an increased probability of, of, of pandemics. Um, I also worry about synthetic biology. It's a bit like Carver would say, it, it will bring immense benefits, but mm -hmm. you know, potentially immense dangers in that sense. Um, I think what we, what we must have is, is a, an access of knowledge. We must have very powerful, and, and, and this is extremely cost-effective, surveillance of, of all sorts. Um, a, a learning, I, I, I was t talking with folks at the Pandemic Institute in, in Oxford today. I think that's a great thing to do. I think they're going to do great stuff. Um, governments need to not take their eye off the ball. I think, I think that's very important. You, you'll notice I've neatly not answered your question. <laughs> well, let me, let me move to another question, which is, if you could say sort of one strong thing to governments at the moment around the world. We're a school of, you know, the Bravatnik School of Government as host of the Kyoto Prizes. Um, our belief is that, you know, one of the great benefits of well-governed societies is that they can enable brilliant scientists, musicians, artists like these folk to flourish. Um, and to do that takes working on government and helping governments do better. And I'd, I'd love to hear from each of you in your domains. What is it that you would want to say to governments? Can I do two? Brian? Yes, you can do two. Okay, so the first, the first is a general one, and it's, it's, it, it's kind of obvious, and I think we all think this, is equity of all sorts mm -hmm. in global health, all mm -hmm. the way from um, across countries, the distribution of vaccines, uh, COVID-19, the wonderful vaccines that were produced, many mm. other things. It would, it, it, it's morally the best thing to do, but it would hugely re, re, repay the, um, the investment. Something closer to home for me, and I could, I could depict many things here, is surveillance. We have to understand, um, if a threat is coming, we have to be able to surveil it. And surveillance, viral surveillance, um, which was a triumph in the US, in the UK rather, not in the US, it was a triumph in the UK in, in the pandemic. Um, uh, immunological surveillance, which I'll talk about a little bit tomorrow. Um, uh, surveillance and understanding of how human behaviour interacts with epidemics. So those data sets, surveillance as in the Blavatnik, about um, what government responses are and how we, how we correlate those actually with transmission. Um, if, if we had, and this isn't going to be too, too um, uh, cheap to do, of course, but if we could do that, we'd at least be in a more powerful position. Mm. I have to ask you, though, if governments did have a very sophisticated early warning system of pandemics, do you think they'd actually do better in managing them? So, so that's really a question for you folks. <laughs> <laughs> Deftly handled. <laughs> right. Well, we'll pick it up. But, um, Zakia, what would you say to governments? Well, have we not always lived in a, in a sort of a continuum of pandemic? Mm -hmm. It's always been there. Mm -hmm. We just magnify it every once in a while uh, to get our attention towards, uh, you know, health mm -hmm. and uh, 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 business, whatever reasons there might be. We uh, magnify different pandemics. People die mm -hmm. regularly from being sick, from being cancer, from whatever. But, and and uh, so I feel that uh, the, what the government hasn't done or, or focused on or maybe asked to or requested or twisted their arm to be doing is to be able to uh, make our living condition and our environments better. Mm -hmm. and may may and 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 put special focus on that and and that focus is is ob obviously a a two way street it's not just the government or the office it's also we the people 
who need to be able to understand uh, a, a, a clean way of living. And uh, I, I imagine that's one way we can possibly uh, lessen the, the sirens going off uh, so frequently. And, uh, and, uh, and so I feel the government needs to do that. And, uh, and uh, the heads up, uh, like uh, Brian here says, uh, they, they need to be right on top of it. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, uh, I guess propagate uh, a healthy living system. And quite apart from COVID, just Composing? As, apart from COVID and pandemics and uh -huh. all of that, as an artist and with your vision of the importance of art and music in bringing that stillness, that connection to us, <clears throat> is, there any, is there anything that comes out of that that you would say to governments? Well, uh, they need to put, put sensitive, aware uh, people uh, in the thick of it for uh, any of this to be able to be preserved and nurtured. Uh, my experience in at least where I come from has been that uh, the bureaucrats uh, are, are in charge of, uh, of uh, running a, a ship that they'd have no clue of how to read the compass off, mm -hmm. and uh, and therefore uh, running it aground is a frequent affair, and uh, so therefore uh, I guess uh, the government needs to be aware of uh, putting uh, the kind of people who un understand the need, uh, the problem at hand, and and uh, the ways to be able to uh, uh, deal with it and uh, to find the right minds that could help them uh, establish uh, a path that would uh, uh, help uh, preserve and nurture that which is so near and dear to us and that which defines us, our culture defines us. Mm -hmm. uh, it uh, gives us our identity, it uh, gives us our face mm -hmm. that we bring to the people and, and allows us to be able to interact and converse from a place of confidence. Mm -hmm. That's what culture does. And, 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 and if we are not able to in any way uh, find people who are sensitive to that, and are you know uh, ready to be able to uh, act in 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 its interest? Mm -hmm. um, then it doesn't matter. Uh, so far in this uh, our planet, the governments have been found wanting mm -hmm. in in many areas, and uh, um, I have not myself felt that. Um, they have been able to uh, uh, be sensitive to what needs to be done. And so, at least in India, what I find is that there are pockets of, of, uh, of various cultural ambassadors who create their own little army of, of uh, you know, workers or volunteers who help to make this happen, who help to propagate, who help to, you know, apostles, if you may will, mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and go out there and, and, uh, and, and, and preach uh, w and, and bring to light to people uh, that, which is, uh, which, that which defines us, mm -hmm. and which is our culture, our art, and our music. And, and this has been the case all over the world. Every now and then the government wakes up and gives you an award and gives you a, a, a stipend of some kind or something. Uh, but there are very few places which focus mm -hmm. uh, on, on being able to propagate and support uh, the, the advancement of uh, our way of life, the human way of life. And, and you know... Does, uh, that, does that become harder? I mean, it's... It's almost as if you're saying that, that music, like the other arts, can be the eyes and ears on a much wider society than bureaucrats often see. 
But as you become a superstar artist, you've won so many awards and prizes and been celebrated. Does that take you away from that? Does it, well, uh, does I it think mean you're creating a, 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 di a different space, which is more for the sort of New York, you know, concert going set rather than the, the well, people that you're referring yeah, to? I see. Well, I think our mistake mm. as, as a representative of the art form mm. is that we want to be, you know, like, I don't know, I think bigger than what we should be. Mm -hmm. Uh, the core has to be preserved. Mm -hmm. And when the core is preserved, and that is the tradition, uh, uh, if, and it has the solid uh, planting, it, it will uh, blossom and, and would uh, be valid for any time, whether it's present or the future. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so it should not just be in the past, mm -hmm. it should be uh, made valid for today and tomorrow. And, and uh, so uh, my uh, feeling is that we as artists should not believe that that is a Rolls Royce and I want it. Mm -hmm. uh, because I, I, all I need is a Fiat. Mm -hmm. Right. So, uh, Stay I mean, why should uh, an opera be performed for 50,000 people? Mm -hmm when it actually is made for an environment and an ambience which is more intimate and more chamber mm -hmm. and, and has more strength to be able to convey mm -hmm. uh, that which uh, it, it uh, proposes. And, and, and so uh, I w do not feel that Indian classical music, for instance, mm -hmm. needs to be Bollywood pop music. Mm -hmm. and, and so that is a whole different fish mm -hmm. That needs its own frying or grilling, <laughs> but uh, uh, right. Indian classical music is a chamber art form, and for me to think that it, I should have that music become uh, a superstar esque uh, stadium oriented mm. performance art form is wrong. Mm. So right. the, the 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 preserving of that culture is to be in the core. Mm. So if the core survives and uh, is is solid enough, it will be valid for whatever lies in the future, and and would not impose itself on on what is being uh, proposed, keeping the roots in mind, but would find a way to be able to seamlessly uh, mesh. Right. with what is being proposed forward. Thank you. Kava, let me come to you. What would you want to say to governments? If you could instruct them on what they ought to be doing. Um, your, your mute switch is on, I think. Come on. Here we go. There we go, fantastic. Uh, the, uh, the role of government in the US, at least, has largely been to very strongly support the status quo and make sure there aren't any real progress of any fundamental sort. So as long as progress is small steps from where we are, which are easy to see, uh, they're supported well. But anything that's really a step forward uh, is treated with great suspicion and uh, is not uh, looked at as uh, what we're here for. Uh, that's a, a universal across all fields. Uh, we saw it with the COVID where uh, there were numerous uh, small organizations, individuals, startup companies that had very good things that could have helped with the situation, but it was in the hands of bureaucrats. And that set us back at least six months in doing anything sensible about the, the COVID. And that's uh, true in today's world with the support of, of research. Uh, it, it this, What gets supported is the status quo slightly embellished around the edges. But anything fundamental and a true 
look forward, it's going to require a rethink of any substantial sort uh, is simply not supported. But didn't your, your whole area of science result from very significant government investments in the United States in the 50s and 60s in core technological research, you know, RAND well, it, and everything else? It, be it became supported after we showed that it was powerful and it would work and all that. Mm -hmm. In the early times, uh, was simply not supported. Although there was, at that time, one agency, the uh, Office of Naval Research, a very small government agency that did support uh, more adventurous things like what I was doing. Uh, but uh, then that got more political as time went on. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, yes, there were times when there were visionary people in the agencies which had uh, the freedom to choose uh, things which were were going in new directions, uh, and they rapidly got shut down as what emerged was something that didn't fit with the status quo. Mm -hmm. I'm going to come to the audience for questions for each of you in a moment, but just before we do, over these two days of the Kyoto Prize at Oxford, we get to hear each of the laureates give a lecture, which really helps us see into their world, um, or a performance indeed, which helps us see into their world and see their brilliance in their field. Carver, if you, is there any, if we put to one side the extraordinary successes in your own field, is there any ability or gift that, you've, that you would wish to have that you don't have? Is there any part of you that you might be a brilliant tabla player as well? It wouldn't surprise me. But is there any part of you, for example, that thinks, gosh, I wish I were a brilliant ballet dancer or something? Uh, <laughs> I am very thankful that I've been able to follow my own heart in terms of what I think is important. Mm -hmm. I had to uh, retire to be able to do that. <laughs> and so being an emeritus person has given me great freedom to uh, pursue what I believe is the direction for the future. Uh, so I don't have uh, any wishes for myself in that direction, but I have wishes that the young people coming along would not be shut down in the way they have been by the fields that I mentioned in my talk. Mm -hmm. Right. Corralled into one, one track or another too soon. Yeah, interesting. Zakir, is there an ability, if this is a hypothetical world, is there an ability that you look longingly at and think, in addition to being a brilliant, brilliant musician, it would be quite nice to be... <coughs> To be able to find the right words to speak that would make <laughs> sense to the young people to, and, 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 and put them on the right path because mm -hmm. they are our future, mm -hmm. they are our strength mm -hmm. and, uh, and uh, for us to be able to uh, watch their back, those right words are very important mm -hmm. to, and, and, and it's, uh, you know, there are many detours that have been set in their paths. Uh, that uh, that take them away, veer them away, and to to so many different uh, uh, not necessary uh, scenery, and, and and so if one could find the right words to speak to them, that's the ability I would like to have, mm -hmm. be on the same wavelength. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What about you, Brian? So 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 like Kava, I'm I'm um, I'm very privileged and lucky that I've got an avocation that I love. Mm -hmm. But but one thing, actually, is I'm, like many Brits of my generation, pretty determinedly monoglot. And that's, that's and for, sad, really, because I was brought up in a household, obviously English-speaking, but my mum spoke Welsh 
fluently, mm -hmm. to her friends and so on. Mm -hmm. And I wish I'd learned Welsh at mm. least. And mm. maybe if I ever retire, mm -hmm. then that'll be a, that'll be something to do. It's a, it's a hard language to learn yeah. as a as an adult, but I can pronounce it at least. In terms. But uh, to be to be a, a better linguist would be a nice thing to be able to do. I think. Brilliant. So our three Kyoto laureates. Let me let me open up to find out if there are <laughs> questions that any of the audience would like to put to. Any of our three laureates? Any questions from you? Yes, at the back. And do introduce yourself. Thank you. Uh, my name is Koshika Krishna. I'm from India and I'm studying MPP at Blavatnik. I have a question for um, Mr. Zakir. Uh, I'm a human rights lawyer in India, so I've also done some work uh, trying to get um, benefits required for folk artists in Maharashtra. And it was very difficult trying to navigate uh, bureaucracy. Uh, uh -huh. It took me two years. So I very much appreciate uh, you bringing out the bureaucratic side and like supporting and preserving art form. And my question is related <laughs> to that. So I wanted to ask you, what are your thoughts on the current state of uh, you know just preserving and nourishing folk art in India? And in particular, I'm wondering how you would answer that question in the context of how do we preserve them when it may or may not say link up to um, the current political climate and doesn't say, for instance, um, is in consonance with the nationalist, nationalistic identity and fervor that's being built. So how do you not make it, how do you still preserve contradictory art forms, et cetera, that may not uh, favor the common narrative that currently is the challenge that we politically face in India? And what your thoughts are on that? Ah, very nice to meet you. Good question. Uh, as I was saying earlier, <clears throat> you got to have the right person at the helm uh, who can drive us in the direction that we need to go. Uh, and by folk art, I imagine you mean you not just mean uh, uh, performing arts. You also mean cottage industries and you know various other uh, 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 you know village. Uh, art forms that uh, need to be preserved and nurtured, uh, uh, we find that uh, there is some focus by governments in their particular states, uh, state governments, uh, uh, to, to uh, try and find a way to be able to uh, uh, create uh, uh, in, an environment for the artists of all varieties to 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 have what they need to be able to uh, not only survive but to be able to bring forth their art form into uh, the 21st century and uh, is 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 this a 21st century yes it is a 21st century um, <laughs> and uh, so state governments are actually trying to do that in maharashtra uh, there is a special attention being paid to, um, um, uh, like for instance in Latur or Peyton, the way they make the sarees, Peytani sarees. Uh, there is a special program to do that in, 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 in big cities, metropolises in Maharashtra, in Bengal, in Madhya Pradesh, and so on. And so in Rajasthan, there is uh, an effort to be able to locally uh, support and 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 uh, nurture the 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 folk arts and and so that's going on. I I find that center uh, the central government uh, um, is not a, as aware of and and that being said, uh, I guess it's it it has a lot to do with which party is ruling in which state and how that. Uh, plays out in, 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 in being the ones who care, uh, banner. And, and, and so that, that is, is something that will always be there. But uh, having the right person in, in, in place to be able to run the system um, is, is the first thing. We're working, we're working on that in the Blavatnik School. And secondly, the right They're words. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. <coughs> yes. Here, if we can bring the microphone up to here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, all, <clears throat> all of you. Uh, my name's Tony Hope. I have a background in 
psychiatry and medical ethics. <clears throat> My question is to Professor Grenfell. Um, you mentioned that Britain got at least some of the surveillance right better than the United States. A lot of things Britain didn't do well, but I wondered what you thought made the difference. Why did the US and the UK respond differently on that? I mean, I mean, there would be people in the audience who, who would have a, a more specific view. Knowing the people, uh, some of the people I do who are involved, you know, a lot of it's about, I mean, channeling Mr. Inamori, actually, a lot of it's about networks and about, um, uh, you know, it, it's a big place with a sophisticated uh, public health infrastructure, but it's not that big and it's not split up as the states are, so that X would talk to Y and then, you know, I understand, as I understand it, the sort of industrialization of the sequencing via the Sanger and other places was then possible. Um, the, 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 the recovery trial was, is, is not surveillance, but is another example where, where it was um, not chance meetings exactly, but the minds were prepared to, to build and to grow those things. And I, th I, th I think that's part of it. There, there are, the, you know, the, the other thing was the, the Office for National Statistics exist, exists. And there is, there is, to my knowledge, no equivalent in the US. And that is an absolute duel. The, the, the difficulty now is, and I'm not in this country so I can say it, is that, you know, in, in, given the current economic uh, difficulties, um, a, a lot of the money for those things is being, is, is being pulled away. And therefore, those wonderful people are, are, are having to find other ways to, to do that surveillance. Next question. Does anyone have a... While, we, while you ponder on your questions. Carver, let me ask you, did you, ever, did you ever... What's the closest you ever got to just giving up and saying, actually, this is just too difficult? Oh, no. Uh, you just don't do that. Uh, you find a way to keep under the radar and keep making progress uh, by hook or crook. And um, then when you start making enough progress, uh, sooner or later, uh, it becomes visible. But uh, often that's a longer and more difficult path than it needs to be. But maybe that's just the process of weeding out things that are lasting. Hmm. So what's your advice to folks listening to this who are right in the middle of their doctorates, toiling well, away? If you have a way that you can see is a way forward, go for it and don't let anything stop you and you will be able to make it, but uh, nobody promises it to be easy. What a, thank you, Carver. What about you, Zakir? You started performing, according to what I've read, at age seven. Was there ever a moment when you just thought, enough of this? Oh, no. Uh, I agree with Carver. I mean, uh, the fact is that when you have found a connection that is so pristine, so so uh, exciting, and 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 so uh, friendly and and loving, uh, it's and and you suddenly realize you're in the best playpen in the world, and you've got the best toy that there ever is, a best friend, and 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 so that relationship. Uh, is uh, can only uh, uh, flourish. Uh, uh, there's no not uh, moving forward with it. There is no not having fun. There's no not having joy in this. I mean, if you love doing, I mean, for me, it is important that whatever whatever you do, I tell all my friends, uh, if it's work, then it's not worth it. Right. It has to be uh, something that you enjoy doing, you love doing, and there's there's an immense amount of joy, and and there's a just perfect amount of ecstasy every now and then for having reached uh, a turning point, and 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 so no, I mean I have not felt ever that uh, uh, that that I have to uh, it just throw my arms up and give up. There are, 
great masters who've been told, oh, maestro, you were perfect today. And the master has said, I haven't yet played good enough to quit. <laughs> and, 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 and that is true. Uh, uh, there is no ending to this. There's always a move forward. And, 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 and the sun shines when you have that kind of a connection. It happens once in a lifetime or t ten lifetimes. I feel I found it and, and there's no way to uh, get to a point where I have to turn it off. <laughs> Brian, there's a question here from one of the audience online, which is about whether we, it's about how we educate scientists and as the boundaries of technology and science expand, um, should we have more education in the arts and humanities for scientists? Um, long before they reach the boundaries of the possible, the, the attendee asks, what practical steps would you take to put that into doctoral training? So the first step is, I mean, also before that, but the first step is, um, is at the undergraduate level, probably, mm -hmm. as I said before that, and, and throw it out there for the audience, adopt a liberal arts education. Mm. You know, the, the, the kids in Princeton, the historians, you know, many of them do computer science, the, the key computer science course, so they're very, very numerate. A lot of the, of the uh, um, uh, arts and history and so on and philosophers are, are, are numerate. Uh, a, a lot of the, en the engineers have to do, uh, you know, a social mm. science and, and humanities courses and languages and so on. So, so that's, that's a good, good first step, I think. And but if someone was coming to you to do a doctorate with you... Yes. And their undergraduate degree was Shakespeare. Is that you'd take them on if they were really good? Yeah, of course. Mm. Yes, absolutely. And train them in what they need to be population biologists. Yes, yes. I mean, you know, if if they've got exactly the skills that that's needed for the job mm. that they need to do, even better. So if they come in with those mm. skills. But I think I think I, I think the the questioner gets it right. Mm. I think mm. much more cross training. But, and Is what it? if they've only done biology and maths and they come to do their doctorate with you? They're brilliant at those things. Would you send them off to study Shakespeare while they were doing their doctorate? Do you know, I, I wouldn't. Because mm. um, mm. uh, I think that's what the person's asking. They're saying, shouldn't there be some philosophy or arts, humanities component compulsory in a scientific doctorate or a technology doctorate? I, 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 I'm very apt to argue about mm. this, but mm. I think the key time, mm. because there are structures mm. in place for it, mm. certainly in the North mm. American system, it, it, at the undergraduate level, is a much better yeah. time to do that. As a PhD stu student, mm. you know, you need to get through and then you're building a... It's partly a professional mm. thing mm. by that point. Mm. Your, 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 your avocation is mm. to become maybe a scientist. Mm. So I, I think it's a really interesting idea, but I would do it earlier, I think. And Carver, what about you? What about the, the brilliant graduate student that comes to you and since age 10 they've been doing maths and computing? and they want to do their doctorate, would you, would you want them to be doing something else or would you just go with what they're brilliant at? Oh, I, what's wonderful is when a student has a, uh, a deep connection with some way of understanding. And uh, the trouble with making requirements for broadening the education is they always pick things that the students aren't interested in. <laughs> and the whole point of a broad education is for a student to be able to follow directions that call to them, mm -hmm. not to be forced through something because somebody once in history thought it was a good idea. Mm -hmm. So I think, uh, you know, making more requirements is exactly the opposite direction mm -hmm. of making a broad education. So how would you encourage the researchers in your area to, to broaden their perspective so as to be able to answer these difficult questions about where the limits of technology, human progress lie? Well, we, we do have a, an active program at Caltech right now to re 
revitalize our undergraduate program in a way that gives the students active participation in things going on in all of the academic divisions. And I think that is a way of broadening their experience that works because they get to choose the things they're interested in. And if you do it that way, that can be a very positive thing. If you start trying to force everybody through the same extrusion process, which is what happens in many educational places, it's counterproductive. It just uh, hardens people's. Right. Right. It takes away from their passion. Exactly. And that's exactly what you don't want to do. You want them to be able to follow their passion wherever it takes them. Mm. And it will take the marvelous places if you just let it grow and develop. Mm -hmm. Which I think you're seeing in all three of these um, mm -hmm. Kyoto laureates, an incredible passion for what they each do. Any other question from the audience? Yes. Oh. And do introduce yourself. Thanks. I'm Chris Stone. I'm a professor of practice of public integrity at the Blavatnik School of Government. And I'm just curious, um, I recall some years ago when the Nobel Peace Prize was awarded to Barack Obama in, at the very early in his tenure, and when people were asked well, what could possibly have been the theory, it was, well, maybe by giving the prize now he'll live up to it um, in, in, in his service. If you, were, if you were able to talk to next year's jury for the Kyoto Prize, what would you want them to understand as the most important role that a prize like this plays in your field? Mm. Right. Well, we've got them all really thinking about that. Carver, do you want to jump in? Uh, yes, for me it has allowed me the freedom to express very strongly uh, the directions that I think are important, which are counter to most of the status quo and the thinking of the day, the zeitgeist. So um, I think what I'm trying to do is to pass on the support of thinking in their own direction to the next generation. And I think if the Kyoto Prize can bring that forward uh, to our young people, they will have done something that's very close to Mr. Inamori's heart. So yeah. you mean set it up as a prize they can aspire to or give the prize to people earlier in their career? Just to clarify, Carver. Uh, I don't know the answer to that. All right. Um, it, uh, you know, I was given the prize for something I did in the 60s and 70s. And uh, uh, people finally noticed that it actually mattered. Uh, <laughs> would it have helped me earlier on? Probably, but uh, it's been a great, it's been a great help mm. now. Mm. So uh, you choose. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. Zakir. Well, uh, sometimes uh, I guess uh, the powers that are in, in, in places which have the responsibility to be able to uh, uh, celebrate uh, uh, somebody's achievement by awarding them, uh, you tend to fall into that in interesting trap and that is get somebody who can uh, also bring attention to the prize that we are giving and therefore get uh, a kind of personality that already has a visibility and and whether that uh, is uh, one of the important reasons mm -hmm. uh, or not I don't know uh, but it does happen that way uh, and, and, and so you find a president or, a, or, a, or an actor or whoever it is to be given something uh, that uh, not only uh, uh, 
uh, celebrates uh, the award being given, but also for some reason raises the attention level uh, uh, of, 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 of the award. And, 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 and whether it should be given at a young age or not, uh, I agree with uh, Kava that uh, it's, it's difficult to determine that uh, it would help then or it would help now. Would it uh, help uh, or make you relax a little too much? Oh, I, you know, and, and let's take a vacation that goes on forever. Who knows? Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, so um, I think the focus on the job at hand mm -hmm. is intense uh, no matter what. And, and, and so uh, um, I think it, the award should come uh, at a time when it is not only uh, appreciated that much more by the one who's receiving. I mean, uh, this is, I mean, for instance, me receiving the Kyoto Award, it's, it's something that has happened, um, I believe, at the right time. Mm -hmm. and, I mean, I'm in my 70s, but it doesn't feel like that uh, um, in, in any way, or it should have been 30 years ago, mm -hmm. uh, I probably would have bought a Mercedes and, <laughs> and with all the trimmings and, and said, ah, okay, but, but now it is more important yeah. that it be used uh, for, 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 you know, purposes that will help yeah. uh, take this, uh, what that I do forward. And Brian, what, what's your reflection on the prize? And it's so, so I knew a little about the Kyoto Prize because mm. three people in my little department have, have it, so I knew something about it. Um, uh, but, but Are the nominators from Prince of Notes? But, 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 then, <laughs> but then reading the list yeah. it, of, of laureates is extraordinarily humbling. Mm. And I think, I think that, that it, 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 it's, it's, a, it's a brilliantly sort of eclectic list. Uh, but, but this idea of Mr. Inamori, that they were all beavering away quietly and doing stuff, um, I, mm. I think that's valuable as well. I mean, I think I, think I take the point of the question that um, it, it, it's good if it, uh, if it uh, achieves other purposes. But, but that idea of beavering away at something um, uh, 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 over a chunk of a lifetime is also a good thing to celebrate. Mm. I think. Mm, thank you. Um, Let's finish with a question which is from an attendee. Um, and I think they're speaking to you know, many people um, in the audience who are at that point in their careers where there are disappointments as well as successes. And so the question is, how do you manage disappointment? How have you managed disappointment? With successes such as yours, there must have been some failures along the way, they write. How in your careers have you managed disappointment? So you go down to the pub. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Is you go down to the pub, and you and you brush yourself off, and you carry on. Right? Yeah, absolutely. There we are. Advice one. Yeah. Same. Yeah. Same yeah. advice. Same thing. I welcome disappointment. Mm. It's a learning process, mm. uh, and 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 so yes, it's uh, if you don't fail five thousand times, you're not going to succeed that one little time, mm. and and so yes, disappointment is a welcome uh, opportunity. Mm -hmm. So question, don't be down until you've, you've had 5,000 disappointments, says Zakir. Kava, what, what's your thought on that? Uh, precisely the same point. I always tell students that if the experiment does what you think it should do, you haven't learned anything. Mm -hmm. So it's only the things that don't work that you learn from. So when something hits you that really didn't expect, Instead of a big disappointment, it's a big chance to learn. So uh, you have to treat it that way because then you'll learn a lot. Thank you very much. Was there any fi was there any final burning question from the audience? I yes, I'll take one last one from this lady here. You know, there's always somebody. I remember in, when I first arrived in Oxford, and there was somebody who ran out of the lecture theatre, so upset at the end of a lecture, saying, that guest, my whole doctorate is about that person, and they didn't call on me to ask a question. <laughs> it's always stayed in my mind. Yeah. Uh, I have a question mm. for Professor uh, Greenfield. 
Uh, how do you assess China's policy response to COVID-19 pandemic, uh, particularly in terms of the containment measures, public health communication, and international collaboration? So that's oh. a weighty. That's a great and weighty question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I mean, I mean, I think, I think, um, early containment. It, it was a surprise to everybody, right? So it's it, it, it's easy to critique, but there's a whole story about the origins, which I won't get into, and about early containment. I think, I think, for such a big country, slowing slowing it down was done successfully, but then that was extended too much. Um, and uh, in terms of international collaboration, I'm I'm not an expert in that, and I can't really say very much about it. Mm. Right, but thank you for opening a, a dinner discussion topic for, for, uh -huh. for, for folks. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I give you Brian Grenfell, the man who coined philodynamics and uh -huh. can guide us through the next pandemic, the most dazzling tabla player in the world in Zakir Hussein, and Carver Mead, godfather of the technologies upon which all of us rely, a wonderful three Kyoto laureates. Thank you so much for being with us, Vice Chancellor. It's wonderful to have you with us. Your Excellency, the Ambassador of Japan. This is Inamori Kanazawa. It's such an honor to have you and your colleagues from the Inamori Foundation with you, and so many colleagues from right across Oxford. Thank you for being with us here this evening. Please join me in thanking the three Kyoto laureates of this year. Thank you. Well done.